Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. I have the honor of, of bringing to you the webinar called The Benefits of Incorporating an Adverse Childhood Experience, The Lens in the Social Work Practice. Before I begin, I want to acknowledge the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers is in Migwagi, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. We are all treaty people in Mi'kmaq with treaty rights and responsibilities. And we acknowledge the histories, contributions, and legacies of the African Nova Scotian people and communities who have been here for over 400 years. My name is Annamika Vink, professional practice consultant with the Nova Scotia Con uh, College of Social Workers. Today's webinar is in collaboration with uh, the Canadian Association of Social Workers, who we really want to extend our appreciation and, um, and uh, acknowledgement to for their annual support and, and recognition of National Social Work Month. The 2021 theme for Social Work Month this year is um, Social Work is Essential. And from all our colleagues, far and, to all our colleagues far and wide, we in Nova Scotia wish you a happy, no, no, happy Social Work Month. Now for some housekeeping details. Of course, this um, webinar presentation will be approximately 40 minutes, followed by a 20 minute period of questions and answers that I will moderate. Please note that all the details you need, like how to access the slide deck, other resources, how to get your certificate of attendance and other housekeeping information, it's all found at the bottom of your screen. All those turquoise widgets can be accessed by clicking the icons at the bottom of your window. You can also resize and move around any of your elements that you see on your screen to customize your own viewing experience. During the presentation, I encourage you to type in your questions at any time, and I will be asking them at the end of the presentation during the question and answer period. We have the opportunity today to hear about the benefits of incorporating an adverse childhood experience lens in social work practice. We're really grateful for that. It's been, as the speakers were just consulting this morning, it's been a six year process to bring this to so many viewers, so we're really grateful that you're here. The workshop will present a brief overview of the research related to adverse childhood experiences, or otherwise known as ACE, and how this science can better equip, equip social workers to assist clients to lead authentic, fulfilling, and autonomous lives. Our first speaker is Nancy Ross. Nancy Ross is an assistant professor in the School of Social Work at Dalhousie University. Her previous work as a clinical therapist in mental health and addiction services informs her research interests which include a focus on the role of social work in mental health, gender-based violence, adverse child experiences, and resilience. She applies a peace-building and intersectional lens to the analysis of justice, social, of justice system responses to domestic violence and systemic and policy responses to adverse childhood experiences. She has produced a short film titled Women of Substance that profiled stories of women meeting challenges of, mis of substance misuse and co-produced a second film titled I Work for Change, which explored the complexity of social work while celebrating the profession. The second speaker is named Elizabeth Perry, uh, who is the founder of ACES Canada, an organization with the mission to advance ACES awareness. <clears throat> prevention and healing. When Elizabeth learned about ACEs later in life, she realized they were, advocate, they were the missing piece in her self-understanding. Since then, she's been advocating for the incorporation of this knowledge into our collective consciousness by spreading the word, reaching out across sectors, including internationally, hosting multiple online communities of collaborators, all contributing to the global movement. Elizabeth uses her lived experience to contextualize her passion for sharing the knowledge of ACEs. She also provides training and consulting in ACEs and trauma-informed organizations. We're glad to have her with us. Kevin Dugas, who is a Master of Social Work candidate in the Dalhousie University School of Social Work, is our third speaker. He also has a Master's in Educational Psychology from McGill University. Prior to his initial graduate studies, Kevin worked at a as a research laboratory manager at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. He has worked as a research coordinator with Dr. Rance, Nancy Ross over the last three or more years. Kevin currently works full-time as a healthcare social worker in the Halifax Infirmary within the Rehabilitation and Supportive Care Portfolio. 
And word has it that he also has a wonderful hobby of playing the bagpipes. With that, I'm honored to pass on to you our incredible presenters, and uh, I offer you Nancy Ross to take it away. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, so I'm going to try to navigate us here on the slides. So everyone has probably seen, okay, let me see. So I just wanna introduce um, our agenda here. Um, and I'm gonna bring that up for me myself. Okay, so what we're hoping to do uh, today in a very short period of time is provide an overview of adverse childhood experiences. And then we're going to have a first voice reflection noting the benefits of, uh, an, of ACE's knowledge. And then uh, Kevin is going to uh, speak to the relevance of ACEs to addiction and mental health settings and in his own work, uh, practicing social work in uh, healthcare. So I'm going to start now uh, with the, the, uh, a brief overview. And okay, I'm gonna to try to bring this up. So, see if someone can help me bring this first slide up uh, the one following the uh, agenda that would be really helpful and while um, we're bringing that slide up it would be um, slide three if someone could help uh, bring that up for me I will just talk a little bit about um, the importance of um, incorporating, incorporating an ACE framework within um, social work practice. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging that since the origin of the profession of social work, uh, we've been addressing the impacts of adverse childhood experiences and working with individuals, families and communities who have experienced trauma. So Hull House in Chicago, founded by Jane Adams, uh, one of the founders of the profession of social work began to provide uh, community services to new immigrants, women and children and families in need as early as 1899. Many of whom had prior experiences of trauma. So the, pro the profession, I believe, intuitively considers what has happened to individuals as opposed to what is wrong with them from the beginning and the emphasis on the social and recognition of the cumulative impact of lived experience influenced by social and cultural factors distinguishes the profession of social work today. So this is uh, lauded as uh, currently as a hallmark of trauma informed approaches and speaks to the importance of a critical and or social justice approach to uh, social work practice. So I believe the benefits of incorporating an adverse childhood experience lens is that it assists social workers to practice in a manner that is aligned with our profession that rests on the belief that what has happened to you matters. From this acknowledgement, it also provides a way to link individual experience to family and community and opens the door to prevention work. So in other words, acknowledging and reflecting on the experiences and prevalences of adverse childhood experiences should lead to the recognition that they are a public health emergency and link personal experience to public and political advocacy. So ACEs originate in our harsh and stressed, stressed social context and are expressed in our relationships. They are all preventable. So the next few slides will provide a brief overview of the ACE, of ACE studies. So on, on my screen, I can't, um, it's not um, showing up, but I'm hoping that you are now looking at a slide that um, features uh, the cover of the book, The Deepest Well. Um, I'm hoping you can see that. Okay, so the Adverse Childhood Experiences study explored the relationship between what has happened to a person during childhood and subsequent physical and psychosocial health issues in adulthood. So the ACE study began as a longitudinal health study in California in 1998. And since then, more than 3000 studies have been conducted around the globe, including Canada, 
which makes connections between experiences of childhood adversity and health challenges across the lifespan. These studies demonstrate that adverse childhood experiences are common and that even one can have serious implications on your physical and mental health. And that the more you experience, the higher your risk of developing physical and mental health challenges. So Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, the Surgeon General of California, refers to the pervasiveness of ACEs, as I've just noted, as a public health emergency. So she appears in a TED Talk titled How Childhood Trauma Affects Health Across a Lifetime, and authored a book about healing the long-term effects of childhood adversity. So I highly recommend that uh, TED Talk. So the original ACEs measured um, measures included physical abuse, as you can see here on the slide, uh, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, physical neglect, emotional neglect, exposure to domestic violence, household substance abuse, uh, household mental illness, uh, parental separation or divorce, incarcerated household member. So since 1998, these, this list has remained the same with additional studies um, adding additional ACEs to become more representative of diverse experiences. So for example, the Philadelphia uh, ACE project expanded the list of ACEs to include five additional items, such as witnessing violence other than a mother uh, being abused, uh, experiencing discrimination based on race or ethnicity, feeling unsafe in your neighborhood or uh, not trusting your neighbors, bullying, and having ever lived in foster care. So we have included more information in the handouts that recognize more experiences that can be described as ACEs. So this slide um, indicates that uh, clearly having a, a critical lens around adverse childhood experiences recognizes that structural and cultural roots that form adverse community environments can limit access to resources uh, and the social determinants of health and a sense of belonging. And this is especially true for um, African Canadians, Indigenous newcomers, persons with disabilities, and members of the LGBTQ uh, plus uh, communities, and people, who, they often experience more um, childhood adverse experiences. So our team uh, conducted an ACE study at the Lunenburg Family Medical Practice in Nova Scotia. And this was a pilot study and you can see here that we were able to interview um, by survey 226 people. And from the, from the people that completed the survey in this uh, medical health uh, study, we found that ACEs were very high. So as you can see here in the results, 73% expressed reporting one adverse childhood experience and 31% reported experiencing four or more adverse childhood experiences. Okay, so I think are my slides. Uh, so I just want to um, say a little bit about uh, a global systemic review and a meta, meta analysis of the effect of multiple adverse childhood experiences on our physical health and mental well being found that individuals who have experienced at least four or more ACEs were more than twice as likely to be current smokers or heavy drinkers, almost six times as likely to drink problematically, about four times uh, more likely to experience anxiety and depression, eight times more likely to be a victim and or perpetrator of violence, 30 more times to uh, attempt, uh, more likely to attempt suicide, and um, 46 more times likely to, to become an IV uh, drug user than those who had no adverse childhood experiences. So working with individuals who have experienced substance abuse, mental health challenges, and prior and current experiences of violence is central to social work practice. The more recent adverse childhood experiences research validates the widespread prevalence of trauma 
and the urgent need to intervene to provide both treatment and advocate prevention of all forms of abuse and violence. So significantly, use and others indicate that the outcomes most strongly associated with multiple ACEs, including interpersonal violence, mental illness, and substance use, pose adverse childhood experiences risks for the next generation. So these ACEs can, be, can cause disruptions in parental ability to provide safe, stable, and nurturing family relationships and pose risk for trauma and chronic and toxic stress for children. So Yuval points out, points to the need for healing from collective trauma as a global responsibility to stop vicious cycles of recurring collective trauma by ultimately integrating and reducing its effects on our global culture. Social workers grapple with these large concepts, recognizing that social injustice and histories of trauma have collective impacts that ripple out across generations and impact individuals, families, and communities. So people often find the adverse childhood experiences research uh, very helpful. It helps them to make sense of their experiences. And as, as my colleague Elizabeth uh, Perry will share, uh, for those who have experienced many ACEs, it helps make sense of their lives to understand the way one responds to adversity and to realize that they are okay. So research conducted uh, by Bethel et al. at John Hopkins University indicate that evidence from assessment of ACEs in adults suggests people do not object to it and find dialogue about ACEs empowering, with some even seeing failure to inquire about ACEs as denying their occurrence and effect. The report titled Repositioning Social Work Practice in Mental Health in Nova Scotia provided a critique of biomedical practices within mental health services influenced by neoliberalism that too often leave out the social and what has happened to people. Our social context is what frames our lived experience and it's inseparable from our mental wellness. So to change life narratives and restory individual adversity and trauma, we need a societal change that transforms the culture and structures to create a society where all can flourish. So social workers need to partner with education, health, justice, community services, etc., to collectively advocate for a more just, inclusive and caring society that promotes wellness and supports families. I've included a slide that looks at the, what I think are some of the relevance of uh, including an adverse childhood experience lens in social work practice. So one, it it's empowers and validates social work practice. I think many uh, people that we interviewed uh, in Nova Scotia about their experiences of working in mental health and addiction services found that they were very limited in terms of how often they could uh, explore past experiences of childhood trauma. And yet the uh, prevalence of it was there in almost every person that they worked with. So I think then it could empower and validate social workers. Pairing ACE questionnaires with resilience measures helps identify those most in need of supports and interventions. Uh, reclaiming the social in healthcare, including mental health and addiction services. Also, it helps uh, introduce complementary interventions to reduce medical and pharmaceutical responses. It can help individuals restory adversity and trauma. It can validate their coping. It can introduce a decolonial and anti-oppressive lens, and it can politicize the personal. And then I wanted to include one uh, further slide that uh, looks at an example of a group program developed by the Embrace model in, in Alberta. And some of you may be familiar with that. And I just wanted to highlight that the focus of each of this six-week uh, group program 
is something that I believe social workers could implement in their practice that could be uh, very helpful. And I just want to point you in that direction. So basically they have developed a six, six week program that is a psychoeducational program that uh, looks at introducing uh, clients to knowledge about ACEs. So their first week uh, of the six week program looks at ACEs and you, and then the second week recognizes the ways that, imp that trauma and adverse childhood experiences impact your physical self and your body. So looking, so they titled that second week, taking care of your body. The third week is looking at um, more maybe of a cognitive uh, behavioral therapy approach and looking at taking care of my thoughts. And the fourth, looking at emotions. Uh, the fifth, taking care of my relationships. And the sixth is taking care of my past and living a valued life. So while this is a very short program of six weeks, I have seen initial results that indicate that it has been very helpful uh, in helping people who have experienced uh, multi ACEs um, to, in their lives. So I just wanted to uh, introduce you to that as there are more and more uh, work uh, being done to explore possible interventions. And I'm also aware that there's an Adverse Childhood Experiences Recovery Workbook. So there is more work done now in terms of recognizing impact of ACEs and how we as social workers can be helpful in intervening in our practice. And so now I'm going to um, hand, us, hand us over to Elizabeth Perry. Thank you so much, Nancy. Welcome, everybody. It's so exciting to see so many people interested in this topic. I've been working on getting the word out for over six years now. And it's so exciting to see that we're getting some momentum and people interested um, more on a personal as well as a professional level. So thank you so much for joining us. What I wanted to do today was just share with you the benefits that I experienced in my own life as a result of understanding about um, about the ACEs research. So I'll just contextualize it a little bit, but I'm also want to acknowledge, I also want to acknowledge that obviously I'm a white woman and I'm of a certain age. So I do not represent everybody's perspective, but I do represent a perspective that I hope you'll understand is actually relevant to this particular topic. So one of the things that, um, so in nine, I'll just start with the story here. So in 2014, I was concurrently reading Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score. At the same time, I was going through some really, per, uh, you know, uh, strenuous personal problems. And so I was seeing my, my therapist again on a very regular basis. And he just happened one day when we were talking about things to mention, well, you know, you might want to look at the ACE study. So I had actually just read that chapter in The Body Keeps the Score. And I thought it was just the same old stuff that I'd ever heard before. But since my therapist pointed it out to me, I went back and I reread that chapter. And then I started researching it to the nth degree. I needed to know what this was all about. And when I did the ACE questionnaire, which is not an official, the, the 10 questions is not the official questionnaire. It's a questionnaire that one of the co-principal investigators, Dr. Robert Anda, put together to use when he was going out, um, speaking primarily to social workers, actually, about his research and trying to get people on board. So he put all of the, um, the original questions into a very short uh, 10 question self-reflective survey. And that's what is available in a lot of uh, contexts now and people are concerned about that not being an official screening tool and being used for that sort of thing. So we need to be careful how we're using that, but it's really great for self-reflection. And when I did that, I discovered that I had a seven. So looking at myself, I'm white, I'm, you know, in my senior years and um, grew up in a, you know, relatively middle class, you know, not always that way, uh, community. And I am not your typical person who would be considered to have a high ACE score. 
And yet, the point about the original LACE study that I think is often not emphasized enough is that that original population was white middle class people. So we need to look at that and um, talk and and realize that that particular uh, research is not primarily for people from sort of the non-dominant um, sectors of society, right? It starts with us. And I've learned a lot from Resma Menikin, the writer of My Grandmother's Hands, and he actually helps us understand that white on white violence is what contributed to white on BIPOC violence you know, that we have been perpetuating for over 500 years in this particular territory at the very least and around the globe. So it wasn't anybody from any other communities that caused my trauma. It was white people and in, and surprisingly, it was white women that um, that caused a lot of my trauma. So we need to be able to look at this and look at it with what I call radical self-honesty, that we are, um, uh, you know, it is us, right? It is us, it is not other, it is us. And the benefit of that is that when I found about it for me, it was this huge relief that I wasn't fatally flawed. I had a lot of difficult experiences and relational, relational experiences in my adulthood. And my family looked at me and they kept saying, like, why do you have such problems? And then when I found out about ACEs, I started to be able to look at that and say, well, you know what, I didn't grow up in the same family conditions that my other siblings, particularly my oldest siblings, uh, grew up in. There was no, you know, sort of support. I didn't have that one supportive adult um, that actually helped me navigate my social and emotional uh, understanding that I did have one that, you know, sort of gave me a, a purpose in life and welcomed me to be able to contribute to, you know, her family activities and things. But it didn't um, help me sort of understand the troubles that I was having with my own you know, my own family, right? So it didn't help me process those uh, relational uh, nuances and things, right? So there was a whole bunch of issues that I experienced in my early life that until I actually heard about the ACE study, I just assumed, as Nancy had mentioned earlier, you know, social work has always been working on these issues. And even when I, um, you know, worked at us, uh, started working with my, my therapist initially, you know, we acknowledge that, you know, early life experiences can be, um, uh, you know, an issue in our adult lives. But until I'd heard the ACEs research and saw the actual categories of experience outlined and described and realized that, you know, out of those 10 categories that were deeply researched, I actually fit in seven of them. And that was a real eye opener for me. So going forward, what I do want to just emphasize is that everybody doesn't agree with the ACEs research. Everybody doesn't like using the ACEs questionnaire. There's a huge concern about that being deterministic, right? I don't promote it as deterministic. I found out about it when I was, oh, must have been, well, a number, you know, a few years ago. So I must have been in my early 50s. And um, so I was able to look at it from a, a, a self-reflective looking at the past situation. Younger people may be a bit more concerned about it being deterministic. And that those are things that we need to be very sensitive with when we're communicating with our, with our clients and our colleagues and even with ourselves. But the ultimate goal of ACEs is that we need to change our relationships. We need to be more set, more compassionate, compassionate towards ourselves, compassionate towards each other. And also we need to, we need to dismantle this colonial culture that we have, um, 
existed in and that, you know, in a lot of ways continues to be perpetuated. I, my original, my, my first career was in early childhood education. And when I first found out about early child, uh, you know, child development and what was required for, you know, nurturing healthy development in, uh, you know, young children, I thought, oh, well, that's okay. I know I didn't have an optimal childhood, so I can just, you know, fill in the gaps for myself. But that even wasn't enough for me. I had lots of bad experiences in relationships after that. And it's only since I found out about ACEs and the specificity of them. And, um, and also now we've included as a handout, uh, hot off the press, 25 additional experiences that can be um, toxically stressful uh, that we just found in that newly uh, published recovery workbook, Adverse Childhood Experiences Re Recovery Workbook published by um, uh, Glenn Schiraldi, who's done a number of different workbooks and great resources over the years. And um, so even just looking at that and seeing that you know, there's a whole bunch of other experiences that can, uh, you know, contribute to our view of ourselves, others, our relationship to the world, and even in our, even to the planet, right? So there's a, a number of things that, that are beneficial to understanding about the ACEs. Uh, I, um, I highly recommend that we, you know, sort of look at ourselves, go cautiously and um, and start to prior start to to flip our priorities in our society, sort of make all of our decisions and our policy and our practice to actually put the children and the needs of the children that we are helping to nurture, um, to develop, to be authentic, um, you know, sort of fully actualized human beings, that we're supporting those children in that development instead of sort of imposing on them the lessons that we have learned along the way, which, you know, are in a lot of ways just a perpetuation of the, uh, the old way of thinking. So I'm all about let's prioritize the kids, let's meet needs, and also meet the needs of the people who are continuing to be affected by the experiences that they had in their early lives without necessarily knowing about it. So there's a few ideas here, um, cautions on using ACES questionnaires. I hope you've had a look at those uh, while I've been talking and um, I will pass it over to Kevin and see how he uses ACES in his uh, clinical work. So thank you very much for attending. Okay, thanks so much, uh, Nancy and Elizabeth. Welcome to everyone uh, viewing across the nation. So I am just going to speak a little bit uh, about, um, you know, how I see the ACEs research unfolding in my daily work and, and how, um, I feel I have truly benefited in my ability to, you know, effectively advocate and support patients I work with, uh, you know, with having this knowledge of ACEs. So I guess I'll just start by uh, saying that uh, back here in Halifax, I work, I've been working a few years now as a healthcare social worker in acute care um, in, at the Halifax Infirmary. So the Halifax Infirmary is one of the primary uh, acute care hospitals uh, here in Nova Scotia based in Halifax. And specifically, I do work with the, uh, the cardiology team. So I'm one of the main uh, social workers who works um, among various inpatient uh, uh, social work inpatient units in cardiology, such as uh, cardiovascular surgery and the uh, and the uh, intensive care unit. And uh, so I truly love my work here. Um, and, and the Halifax Infirmary is the, uh, the, the cardiology hub of Atlanta, Canada. So we truly, from, from a cardiovascular perspective, we truly do treat 
um, the the most ill patients uh, east of Montreal uh, in terms of cardiology. Um, so I wanted to talk about uh, a population of patients that I work with quite regularly, um, and that would be uh, IV drug users. Um, we often have, uh, and as pointed out in the, uh, the study that uh, Nancy spoke of by Hughes uh, and all in 2017, um, I think this is an excellent example that kind of highlights the importance of, of knowing ACEs among our patients uh, because as they found, individuals who had experienced four or more ACEs were 46 times more likely to be an IV drug user. Um, so, you know, this is a particularly vulnerable population that certainly uh, needs to be advocated for. So, and, and in the literature there, um, one of the biggest issues that this population has um, in terms of being admitted to cardiology service is infective endocarditis. Um, so, you know, for those unfamiliar, uh, infective endocarditis is an inflammation of the heart. It's caused by a bacterial or fungal infection of the heart valves or the inner uh, lining of the heart. And if it's not treated quickly, it can lead to life-threatening complications. Uh, so when bacteria and cell debris accumulate inside the heart, clumps can break loose. They can form uh, blood clots and travel through throughout the bloodstream to other organs. Um, and these blood clots can cause serious complications uh, such as uh, heart damage, uh, stroke, pulmonary embolism, seizures, uh, kidney damaged, uh, paralysis, and organ abscesses. And, uh, and infective endocarditis, um, it, it's well established in the literature that uh, that infective endocarditis is a notorious complication of IV drug use. It mostly affects the valves. Um, the tricuspid valve is the most common, but certainly the, the mitral and the aortic valves can be involved as well. And it's MSSA, which is the most common uh, micro, microbial agent that um, is involved in infective endocarditis. So, you know, certainly uh, it's, you know, it's, it can be an incredibly difficult um, thing to advocate for working within such a dominant medical model. And in my experience, um, it, you know, a lot of these patients who are admitted to the, to the cardiology services, they undergo a lot of discrimination and stigma because people generally don't understand, you know, the link between early childhood trauma and IV drug use. And, you know, in, in my experience, it whenever we have an IV drug user um, with substance use disorders admitted to the hospital, I can guarantee without question that when we dig back into their childhood, they were um, exposed to a, an enormous amount of adversity. So, so I use this, um, you know, I use the ACE lens to help educate, whether it's surgeons, uh, physicians, nurse practitioners, uh, to try and advocate for health equality. Oftentimes we'll have examples when, you know, certain surgeons or, or health uh, clinicians will, will actually refuse to provide in some cases, life-saving treatment to someone who is an IV drug user and because they just, you know, they discriminate and they really have so much stigma towards these patients. They say, well, you know, why would we waste our resources and money to help support a person who's choosing to use IV drugs? So. In my work, I use the ACE lens to really advocate, to educate, and really to fight for health equality. Because when often when you create this awareness and educate other members of the health team about trauma, then you know, as a whole, the our multidisciplinary teams 
have a better understanding of how we need to um, indeed support this incredibly vulnerable population. So I use the ACE lens to, to advocate um, and I use it to educate um, in our multidisciplinary teams here in cardiology, uh, use it as to provide educational opportunities to others on our team, such as the nursing staff, and, and really promoting the lens of ACE to be able to more effectively um, support these patients when they're in the hospital. And of course, um, you know, this, this type of example is relevant to other areas of primary health, such as other areas of acute care, and also we know the long-standing links to, to mental health outcomes as well. But I did think this was a, a good example to highlight in terms of the daily work that I do here at the Halifax Infirmary and how the ACE lens really helps me to, to adequately advocate and support patients that I work with. Okay, so um, so just a, a few other examples here about, uh, you know, having the conversation about ACEs and how the research helps me to, to be a better advocate in my social work practice. Um, so in, in, in addition to working on my uh, inpatient units, I also do work with the um, advanced heart failure and the heart transplant clinics here at the Halifax Infirmary. So again, this is a, this is a multidisciplinary uh, team and committee um, working to cover all of Atlantic Canada. So anyone in, in Atlantic Canada who's going through uh, some sort of heart failure, and would benefit from a heart transplant. It's the team here in Halifax that that works with these individuals and 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 does screening to to determine um, if individuals are appropriate candidates to receive a new heart. So again, um, you know, within this within this really dominant medical model team. Um, it, a lot of the things that we the, the committee screens for is um, changing lifestyle behaviors. So really being uh, strict in terms of making sure that patients can uh, be abstinent from alcohol, cigarettes, any other type of um, recreational drug use, uh, do, using a heart healthy diet, exercise. So they're very strict in terms of when they look at these candidates and oftentimes um you know again the the having an ace lens really helps to better understand certain patient profiles um and and a discussion of aces helps you know these individuals to become empowered and realize that you know that their behavior, that they, they shouldn't be blaming themselves if they are engaging in, in drug use because, um, because most often, as I said, these individuals um, have had extreme ACEs. So it really benefits the perspectives on those on the collaborative team, and it helps to educate health practitioners of various stripes about ACE science and it assists with reducing discrimination and increasing health equality. Um, so just as one example, I, I, a number of months ago, I did a psychosocial assessment for a young man in, uh, in, uh, in Atlantic Canada, and I had to speak to, um, you know, whether I thought that this young man would be uh, a, a good candidate to receive a new heart. So I did take an opportunity and through my psychosocial assessment to really get to know individuals, I don't necessarily use the ACE you know, survey formally, but I do ask these individuals about their childhood, about whether they've experienced any traumas. And then um, I also try to integrate the ACE lens and the ACE history with resilience factors. So in this young uh, individual, it was amazing that 
um, despite having experienced tremendous childhood adversity um, and not having any family support, he nonetheless was able to, to be empowered, to become empowered by learning about early childhood trauma and being able to reflect on that and to use other avenues to build his resilience and to really um, you know, increase his behaviors to make him uh, a good candidate for a transplant. So certainly um, without the social work lens and the trauma lens within this collaborative multidisciplinary team, you know, I don't think uh, any others would be able to look at that history, look at his resilience factors, and to speak very confidently in terms of, you know, that this individual is incredibly deserving of a new heart. And so it does allow me to advocate and, and you know, prov provide perspectives to others on the teams. So, and, and again, this is something that applies to other transplant areas as well. So it helps to, you know, by, by integrating the ACE lens, it truly helps these patients to not only feel less stigmatized, less discriminated against, but also to, to become empowered. Um, and I think, uh, I think that's mainly what I was gonna cover uh, in terms of uh, you know, presenting uh, the, the, some of the work that I do in healthcare and how the, the ACE lens and the ACE research, I believe, uh, truly allows me to, to become a more compassionate um, and understanding social worker and it allows me to, to better advocate for, for the patients on my floors. So I think maybe I'll hand it back over to uh, to Nancy Ross to to make just a couple of um, final remarks to close the presentation and move on to questions. I think what we were hoping to do is to engage with some questions, but uh, in terms of final remarks, I would like to say that uh, it's as for social workers, uh, I we recognize that most of the people that we work with have experienced adverse childhood experiences. I think it's something that is central to our profession, but it's not one that is um, often specified. And we know that the adverse childhood experiences science per se has been uh, initiated within um, a medical profession. But I think it's really important for social workers to recognize that the intervention and prevention of adverse childhood experiences is social. It, uh, adverse childhood experiences occur within relationships within the broader social context that we all live in. And also I think when we think about uh, neoliberalism and the ways, the multitude of ways that, in, that neoliberalism puts an emphasis on our own individual efforts and our own individual responsibilities. Uh, in some ways, it, it, it contributes to ignoring the social context. So as social workers, I think we're always resisting that notion and moving to more collective notions of what a society can be. And I think if we look at Afrocentric and Indigenous perspectives, they offer us some ideas and examples of ways in which our society can become less individualistic and more caring with a focus on the overall well-being of gener of uh, our communities and a focus on on the generations to come so as kevin pointed out and as um as we've been at, at we've been making points to to say is that not all individuals who experience childhood adversity suffer all the negative impacts so people who have uh, believe they can get support in the communities who have access to resources, who have people they believe that care about them, they do better and they have more resilience. So in the words of uh, Barry Brazelton, families need families, parents need to be parents, need to be parented, grandparents, aunts and uncles are necessary. So adverse childhood experiences and trauma don't happen in isolation. 
and the consequences of ignoring them is detrimental to all of us. So it is a societal responsibility to reduce ACEs. So we are all implicated. So I believe the benefits of incorporating an adult, um, an adverse childhood experience lens in social work is to strengthen and renew the call to create a society where child abuse and neglect does not exist and one where we can all flourish. So with that, I would like to open uh, it up to questions for all three of us. Thank you very much for attending this presentation. Thank you all so much. I, it feels like that you've generated so much activity in the chat room. It, it's hard for me to pick out who I'm going to be able to talk to talk about first. But thank you so much. It's very exciting. Um, my first question comes from um, when the first question I have here is is related to someone who's talking about reading a, currently reading a book called When the Body Says No. And I'm wondering, she's saying, um, or the person is asking if what, when we found the client's early childhood trauma or past history of trauma, which could lead them to serious disease, what should we do? How can we heal it? So I don't know who wants to take that question. Can well, I guess I'll right? start because, yeah. Uh, I'll start because um, it, uh, first of all, validate that it's not your fault, right? It's, um, it's not a life sentence. It can be mitigated, right? And now's the time to be able to start. So some of the best practices that are helping with uh, processing that sort of thing are uh, the somatic practices, so somatic experiencing, sensory motor psychotherapy, um, any of the work that Resma Menekin offers is fabulous. And um, also in Gabor Mate, who wrote that book, also offers a compassionate inquiry course that he helps to support people in sort of understanding themselves and, and uh, processing their own. But the other thing is, is you know, you don't want to go in and dig stuff out and process that sort of thing. You have to be able to make sure that there's some stability first before you start looking at the deeper issues. And I'll pass over to uh, both uh, Nancy and Kevin, who are actual clinicians, uh, for their input. Well, if I understand the correct the question correctly, I think it's uh, about uh, how do you respond when you start to recognize um, some effects of trauma, and when the body says no. So I think it's to recognize that healing is a process it's not a, a one-time event as elizabeth was talking about so the first it begins with acknowledging that it that there is a need to uh heal and something to address so as as elizabeth said to be compassionate to seek out supports uh to to pace oneself and to uh try to develop practices that help you feel safe as you go on that journey Someone has also added compassionate inquiry. Okay, so some, I'll just chime in here. Uh, Andrea has added that compassionate inquiry has been transformational to her practice as a social worker. So that's what, that's what we're about, learning to be sensitive, aware, and move forward. I wanted to add, um, there was somebody who asked for the resource slide to be returned to the to the front uh front and center on the screen is that the one that i'm looking at now oh, references or resources i'll see if the person and then further to that um there was a question about is the adverse childhood experiences international questionnaire located on the who website or is uh, your aces based off off of that Have, they're wondering, does that make sense to you? The, yes, um, so the World Health Organization does have a standardized um, 
questionnaire, adverse childhood experiences questionnaire that they um, use, that re they recommend using internationally. Um, some people in different localized contexts don't always find it uh, relevant, all of the ACEs. So some people adapt it, but the 10 original ACEs have remained, but people have been, um, there are a number of different um, questions that have been added uh, that are uh, validated in, in, uh, in some research. So I guess, I guess it, you can tailor the adverse childhood experiences somewhat to the context that you're in, but also recognizing that the list of what constitutes adversity is growing as, our, as, as, we, as the resource that we've added uh, shows. I'll just add that in that resource that we added, uh, the um, extended ACEs questions from Sheraldi, I also put a link in there to a blog that I posted um, that has a list of, all, of various uh, ACEs questionnaires, including the um, the one from the WHO, and also an, a link to a, a video and an a, a published article by Robert Anda explaining that 10 questionnaire that, you know, sort of that 10 point questionnaire that he had put together and giving us better context to, the, uh, to its non-research <laughs> quality, but, you know, why he actually put it together. So it gives, you can follow the link in that handout and that'll get you to re, um, ACEs questionnaires and resilience questionnaires. Okay, thank you. Anything more that you'd like to add, Kevin? Um, no, I think I'm okay for now. Okay. Uh, were there any questions, further questions? I'm, I'm going to check here, but um, lots of people are saying thank you for this interesting and important conversation about uh, giving us so much information, actually. Thank you profusely. I was wondering if between the three of you, there were some questions that you had of each other um, that actually speak to the takeaway you want from the audience, of which there have been upwards of 400 people here. So what are, what are your best hopes for when they walk away from this webinar and have all this wealth of information for you and the ACEs that lies ahead in terms of work and research? Well, for me, uh, I feel that uh, adverse childhood experiences, as I said earlier, originated within um, a medical profession. And I think we as social workers need to claim it uh, and maybe reclaim it and to recognize, as I said earlier, that they occur in a social context and in relationships and that they're all preventable and that this is the essence, I think, of much of our social work. Thank you so much. So true. And yeah, I would for, just say I guess for the work that I do. Oops, sorry, go, Kevin. No, I, I guess uh, just uh, just in, within the work that I do, uh, you know, just reiterate that um, for me as a as a fairly um, new social worker and clinician, I find that this research um, has been incredibly valuable for me in terms of being able to be. A, a, a true advocate uh, for the patients that I work with. So in terms of moving forward, you know, I think there's a lot of research left to be done, particularly reflecting more on the, the handout that we've provided and, and, and this enormous list of ACEs that are, you know, that beg us to, to reflect on and to investigate more. Um, one of the biggest ways it helps my practice is, is by having the conversation um, and trying to help my clients to externalize some of their problems and to remove self-blame. I think um, having the discussion about ACEs and, and removing that blame and, and providing people with that light bulb moment truly allows them to to move in a direction where they are more empowered in their personal lives so that's uh that's that's the biggest impact that i see and and uh 
I'll pass it on to you, Elizabeth. I was just going to say, get yourself educated, right? That there's a plethora of information and resources out there. The one that is probably the best in Canada would be the Brain Story certification out of Alberta Family Wellness Initiative. So you can find them online. I believe somebody may have even um, attached a link if they haven't. Um, it's actually it, one of the resources that we posted. So the Brain Story Certification Program is available and social work uh, programs should incorporate that into their curriculum as a requirement. Uh, people who are providing social work through organizations, everyone should be certified to um, in the Brain Story as part of their uh, onboarding for their new uh, roles, if that's possible. Possible. And also there's a, a toolkit that the Alberta Family Wellness Initiative has put together that is um, a set of, of videos that we can use to help inform the wider public about the required circumstances that we need in order to uh, support the developing brains of children, right? So all of those are great to offer and share with parents, obviously not from an imposition, uh, but from a, you know, a collaborative nurturing, you know, scaffolding perspective that, you know, we're all doing this together. And I definitely reiterate and emphasize Nancy's point that this is a social issue, right? That was the key thing that came out of Bessel van der Kolk's chapter on ACEs in the Body Keeps the Score. This is the number one public health issue we're not dealing with right and we need to get um under it and we need to get behind it and we need to transform it thank you elizabeth um i have another question at the moment which is perhaps in the same vein asking how can we promote an ace lens in the healthcare system when the social worker in particular is asking in relation to the local healthcare system doesn't seem to have much empathy for people with addictions and she knows, or we've just learned, of course, that addictions are very related to ACE. So the question, of course, is how do we promote it? And that's a, that's one of our advocacy questions too, isn't it? Does someone want to take that in the next again, the brain, 30 yeah. seconds? I'm just going to reiterate again, the brain story covers off all that. So if everybody okay. gets also, educated in the brain story, even in the healthcare system, right? They cover off that connection between ACEs and addiction. Um, ha Amazing. having worked in addictions, yeah, having worked in addictions for uh, 20 years, uh, I, uh, that has sort of, uh, been the source of my, uh, in inspiration to, to get behind and into the average childhood experiences literature, because I see the, so the connections so clearly. So I think, uh, maybe in terms of educating yourself further, uh, getting more, um, colleagues to discuss it, uh, and. Maybe if you have team meetings and different ways of uh, highlighting the the relevance of it, I know within addiction services across the country right now, it seems that they are influenced a lot by restriction, constraint, and uh, kind of a neoliberal agenda where it sort of uh, puts a, an individual emphasis on people. But I think we need to resist that as social workers, and so to find allies that you can work with that um, are, share the same passion for it. Excellent. Thank you, Nancy. I have one last question. Um, we are running a bit over time. Um, if you need to leave, so be it. Uh, we'll just answer this last question and then wrap up. The question has to do with different perspectives that are going around about giving the ACE survey to clients to fill out. Some social workers feel it can be traumatic for people and others seem to think it's very beneficial um, in ways as have been presented today. Um, it can take away that feeling of it's not, it's my fault, but uh, do you recommend clients fill it out directly or that maybe the social worker should ask when it's feeling safe for the client and appropriate to do so themselves? Nancy, maybe you want some to take of the that? Yeah, sure. Um, some of the research by uh, Christina, Christina Bethel. Uh, she's at the John Hopkins University, and she's done a lot of work around adverse childhood experiences within communities. 
And she suggests that people find it very validating to be asked uh, about the, their, their childhood experiences. And I know also Nadine Burke Harris, who I mentioned earlier, she does have a practice of uh, asking her patients to fill out these questionnaires in the waiting room. And she doesn't necessarily talk about a score, but she talks about the impacts of adverse childhood experiences and uses it as a way to engage in conversation and to help people think about what is trauma, because trauma is such a, a broad word. So I think the adverse childhood experiences can break that down a little bit to explore what is the nature of trauma. So I think in general, people have found that, that those worries about it being traumatic uh, to patients or clients or service users um, has, not been, has not been borne out in practice. In fact, people have found it helpful. And I found that people don't like to be shut down in terms of talking about those experiences, which often it has been an experience they may have encountered. Great, wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you for the great questions, everyone. I just wanna give a quick reminder that all the resources within this presentation will be available to you afterwards in the handout widget. Um, I will add the slide uh, package as well for you to take. The questions have been floating around, can we share this information? And I suspect I answered appropriately by saying, please do. We want people to get comfortable, understood, understanding and aware uh, that we have much more to do in terms of our social work practice and being best agents of change uh, with people who come to talk with us and at a community level. So with that, I would like to say thank you again to each of you, Nancy, Elizabeth, and Kevin. It's been a stellar webinar and um, it'll be on, on site for people to watch later on again uh, within 24 hours. So please keep your eyes open for that or share it as you will. And, uh, and I'll be signing off for tonight. Uh, happy Social Work Month to everyone. Thanks again. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.